Lerdus talking about coming out. Do I have to do something here, Lucas? It's in here, right? Get started. Welcome on stage, Thirdus. This is for you. This is for you. It's not. Is it on? No. Yeah. Now it's on. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yay! Hello. <laughs> so I'm Ferdos, and this is Kaya. And come a little here so they can see you. Yes. And I think it's time to come out. Who here knows Rails Girls? I know that question was asked, but I couldn't see you. <laughs> Everybody. OK, for those who don't know, this was an initiative started in Finland by L Linda Lucas in 2010. It's uh, inspired by Rails Bridge from the US, and it's for beginner workshops for women, free beginner workshops, programming workshops for women. And we started our own chapter in, Re in Berlin. Uh, Ute, who's an organizer here, I can't see her. Yes, she's there. She was one of the organizers and founders, and she's amazing. And um, it's been seven years that we've been doing this. Uh, we've had more than 1,500 students. Uh, we've had about 40 workshops, eight project groups that have formed ever since, and a pool of about uh, 300 coaches that help us volunteer for us. And But we've grown up and we're slowly thinking of coming out. Yeah, so um, uh, we went on a retreat like one and a half years ago and uh, where we finally had time to think a little bit about ourselves and we realized, hey, um, we're not girls. We're all grown up women and um, we're also not really focused on rails but more on coding in general. And um, yeah, so we had uh, a, a big transition process of of uh, criticizing our own name and thinking about like, maybe it's time to grow up and come out with a new name and, and also represent our new uh, identity because there were actually also um, trans and intersex people um, approaching us uh, or even wondering whether they they were welcome on our workshops, which is horrible. I mean, of course they're welcome there. Um, yeah, so um, now we want to present to you the new name and new identity, Code Curious. <laughs> so this, uh, th this name says a little bit more about who we are. We're, we're actually uh, curious people who want to um, bring this curiosity to coding to other people, no matter where they come from and um, what they do or what they did before in their lives. And yeah, so this is also a really cool logo, I think. <laughs> uh, a curious squirrel. Yeah. yeah, so this is the coming out. <laughs> and we're going to throw a party to come out and have fun and show you all what we mean by this. You're all invited. It's going to be in Berlin on 14th of March. Save the date. Um, and contact us in case you know a good location. Our location pulled out last minute because of a double booking. <laughs> but so just tell us. And if you want to sponsor us or your company, please, 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 please come and talk to us. We need you. Um, and generally, talk to us. Also. Am, Kaya, <laughs> me, um, about sponsoring, organizing, helping us organize, uh, coaching, anything. Like, we need all the help we can get. Uh, with Code Curious, we really want to go further and we want to have three tracks, like, ideally, to have like a back end track, maybe with Ruby on Rails, and then have a front end and a DevOps track. Ideally, in a perfect world where we have so many organizers and coaches, we would love to have monthly workshops because there's so many women that, and women with a star, that need help and would love to learn. And every single workshop, we have three times the amount of people that we can take applying. Um, so we need help. Come, come to us and talk to us. 
We wanted to thank Ruby on Ice for everything, for this whole organization, for everything you've done, for the help, for I've sent them so many emails and they've responded immediately and they're just so amazing. And yeah. And we want to thank all the diversity ticket sponsors, like each one of you that just donated a little bit because that's why I'm here. That's why Kaya's here. That's how uh, our Brazilian race girls are here. And you guys are amazing. And we want to give you all the love there is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's an amazing initiative. So now I can switch to... Our next speaker, Tessie, how to stream CSV downloads. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> also, thanks for resetting the time. Um, so the next five <laughs> minutes will be a little less world changing than Code Curious, but it was born out of being curious about code. And it all started um, with this little law of nature that eventually every Rails app will need some kind of CSV download or JSON download. Um, and Rails, it's easy, right? You Google and find the docs or find Stack Overflow. And um, for example, your user's controller can just respond to CSV, the CSV format. And in the render CSV method, you can just send data and send the whole CSV string. And because we are fancy and maintainable and test everything, oh, we know you hear me. Um, and because we test can test everything and it's fancy and so on, we use service objects and um, the service object will give us the whole CSV string and we send it to the user, and that's great. Um, and because the app eventually will get more and more users, um, generating the CSV will take more and more time, and um, after a year or so, you will get the first bug reports that look like this. Um, because the connection timed out, because generating that whole CSV took longer than your HTTP server is willing to wait. Um, and this is where you put your engineering hat on and start implementing sidekick background jobs and produce CSV files in, the, in some backend stored in a temporary file, have to clean it up again, send emails to the user because your CSV is ready. And this used to be so easy, but now it's so much code and so hard, right? And I googled a little and thought maybe we can give the HTTP server something. We, maybe we can stream the CSV data while generating it. Um, so it doesn't time out and the user get in instantly gets data. And this is actually possible with REC. Uh, so not only Rails, but all REC apps. Um, you can just send the, uh, set the response body to an enumerator. And in this case, enumerating through all the numbers in, in the world. Um, and it just works and, and doesn't time out ever. Um, so when we rewrite our user service object um, and refactor it a little bit to on call not return the whole JSON, but only a single line of um, CSV, um, then we can use this enumerator trick to stream to the user, take basically as long as we want within reason, and it won't time out. And this is great, this works. Um, I tried it, um, but then I got curious and thought, hey, when we generate this in Ruby isn't and process lots of data, isn't that fast in the database? And I googled again and found um, the Postgres copy command, which is SQL stuff, I know, but it isn't that hard. It's basically write the word copy in front of your select statement and the word um, format as CSV after it, and you get CSV out. And with a little trick, I don't have time to explain right now, um, the Postgres will stream this to your Ruby app, and you can just forward the stream to the client, and it's all streams, it's all great. And in the end, it looks like this. Um, we built, extracted this to a little gem. Um, you can just render CSV from SQL, for example. Um, could be an active record relation, could be a SQL string, whatever you want. And it will stream. It will actually automatically gzip the response to save some bytes on the wire. Um, and um, I wouldn't just now use it in production <laughs> because it's still, yeah, being honest, I just wrote it on the train right um, to this conference. Uh, <laughs> Um, but the more happy I would be to talk about this. This is just a very small code base, basically three files of Ruby, um, so we can 
enormously over-engineered if we want. Um, we can look at the headers, we can have fun with it. So um, I would be happy if you reach me on Twitter or on GitHub or in person. Um, and thanks. Ship it. Here. Thank you. Our next speaker, Andy. Andy. Andy? Andy. 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 Dance like nobody's watching. Yes. Uh, but I need my Just slides. Just go on. Oh, okay. Next slide. Just like Gorb. Oh, no, Next no. slide. Yay. Okay. Um, so I hope the title is not too misleading. Um, so my name is Andy, and there's a story behind that picture. Feel free to ask me about it later. <laughs> I work as a backend engineer at From A to B. And when I arrived here on Friday, I got a little fortune cookie in my back. And I was saying this, dance like nobody's watching, code like everybody is. And it was so, so true. Um, but on the other hand, it reminded me on the early days of my career where um, I was introduced to the concept of, co of code reviews. And um, it was super scary for me that everyone would watch my code and um, judge it. And um, but then I realized the code reviews are actually pretty great. Um, they bring a lot of good things. Um, so here's why we um, should do code reviews. First of all, it's, it's improve, uh, it improves my code. Like I'm more aware of that people are watching it. And um, it spreads the knowledge across the team because other people read my code. Um, it helps to discover bugs early. And it makes more people responsible. Like. Um, if I do something very stupid and someone approves it, then he's stupid too. <laughs> and, um, but that's not the point, it's just that um, there's no one to blame. And if, the, if there's not a culture of blaming, then it's a culture of failing and figuring out why it failed. Um, but code reviews are um, pretty hard to get right. Um, so I have a few um, points that I, or I have a few experiences that I would like to share with you. Um, and there are actually two sides of it. Like, um, there's something that you can do right as an author of a pull request. Um, that, uh, and this is um, provide a description, like um, give your reviewers some context. Why is this change needed and what does it actually do? And um, keep it as small as possible. If there's anything that's not in scope of what you actually wanted to change, then it can go to another pull request. Um, and if there's a complex problem that's hard to understand, maybe grab someone of your teammates and, and pair with them. And um, if you agreed on a solution, you already have one approved safe. Um, but it's um, way harder to get it right as a reviewer because um, in written communication, there's uh, a lot that can go wrong and that can be misunderstood. Um, so first of all, you should be uh, be aware of your responsibility. If you review your code, it's also your code. So be careful and um, read it carefully and just don't approve everything. And if, if something is too hard to understand, feel free to, to ask. And um, yeah, ask your uh, author to provide more context. Um, ask for change and not dictate changes. I have an example for that. Um, like you can say, um, please change it to be falsy, which is um, not a rude way to say it, but um, it give, it doesn't have very much flexibility. Like, if you really intended to do to use to be false instead of that, then um, yeah, you just don't have to explain. Hey, sorry, you're wrong. I did it intentionally. So where better is like, how about be falsy? So then you can say, hey, that's a good idea, or you say, um, sorry, I hadn't. Um, I I did it like um, be false because um, I thought about it and it's the better way to do it. Um, don't ask rhetorical questions like, why didn't you just do this? Um, because that puts the other one in a, like a defense position. You can also ask, how about this? And suggest a change. And it's still like, it gives you the same value. Some can argue about it or, or just, just uh, agree with you. Um, oh, I even have an example for that. <laughs> Why don't you just use um, be faulty? Okay, um, so this is what I just said. <laughs> um, provide an example. If you want, if you suggest a change, feel free to put a little code block in so it's easier to understand for your author. Um, and always be positive. Um, 
And GitHub introduced this nice little feature of request changes. And in the beginning, I was very careful using it because the icon looked like this. And it looks like you did everything wrong. Please change it. But now they change it to this, which is, which is way more gentle. And it's just like, no, it's not everything wrong. There's just a single a little change. Um, so code like everybody is watching and watch everybody code. Do reviews and be aware that your code will be reviewed because it will really improve your code. Um, this talk was inspired by my fortune cookie. <laughs> and Derek Pryor, um, he has a very nice talk about uh, implementing a strong code review culture. Um, go and watch it, it's pretty cool. And um, yeah, there's a lot more to say about this topic, but it um, doesn't fit in a lightning talk. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, that was really nice. Thank you. First data types. Hello, everybody. Um, I can't see anybody, but uh, yeah, sorry for my cracking voice, but yeah, Bosch uh, everyone, so it was, it was really nice, but uh, it's taxing. Um, okay, uh, I want to talk about uh, data types in your database, and this work is based on uh, some work I've been doing at uh, Heroku for the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, let's set up some context. Um, we have one big table, uh, it's a couple hundred, hundred million records, and as always, like, we have slow query. Um, but this time, actually, I was looking at the data, and like, average is like 10 milliseconds, and I'm like, looks fine, it's all right. Um, but then I discovered, like, we have some crazy outliers there, like up to like 1.2 seconds um, for the same query. Um, so yeah, let's find out what, what went wrong there. Um, so we have a table. Um, I cut out all the unimportant things, and this table has like a large JSON field. Um, to rem remind you, like Postgres has JSON support for four or five years now, and for example, if you want to query some JSON, um, so in this case, I want to query the URL from this JSON blob up there, um, you use this like double arrow notation, and in this case, it will just return um, the URL outside of the JSON blob. So let's look at our actual query. Um, so this is our query. We are selecting the URL from the table. We have some conditions. And if we look down there, execution time, 1.2 seconds. And I'm like, wow, what is going on here? This looks all right. Um, what I first start with is using explain analyze. So if you start looking at two, into like slow queries, explain analyze is a good start. It shows you like internal metrics about indices and stuff. Um, but what I also learned this time is explain analyze buffers. This was new to me and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Because what it does, it gives you um, stats about the uh, IO sub subsystem of uh, Postgres. So in this case, it says buffers shared hit like 7,000 something blocks. And what it means, it's uh, Postgres is reading um, those blocks out of the cache like memory or from disk. And the default um, block size of Postgres is like eight kilobytes. So this is like 60 megabytes of data. And I only want this URL. And I'm like, wow, what are we doing? Like, this is crazy. Um, so yeah, this is like a huge chunk of data that I'm reading and that I'm like throwing away afterwards. And that's not great. So yeah, how do we fix it? Um, what I did is like I converted this one JSON field into three separate text fields. And the query went down from like yeah, 1.2 seconds uh, to like the regular like 10 milliseconds. And my main takeaway here is um, JSON was not necessary for us to use in the first um, to use. Um, but also like when we started this like project like three or four years ago, it was the best choice we had like with the information we had back then. Um, but what changed over the years is like we have way more information like how we use the system. So. For me, it was easy to say like, okay, JSON is totally the wrong data type. But back then, I totally understand why somebody would choose that. So um, it turns out we are inserting the same JSON structure for years. So there's like actually no real point in using a data structure for unstructured data. Um, so we're like kind of misusing JSON there. Um, and again, yeah, reading, reading large chunks of data and throwing it away is not a good spend of your time, I guess. Um, yeah, so what I want to encourage you, go check your database schema, 
Um, what you see there made sense at the time, but maybe it doesn't make sense anymore. So check check back like if it's still the appropriate data type, but also don't change for the sake of changing. And I mean, we are running with this for like a couple of years, so if it works, it works. But yeah, if you run into problems, like it's time to fix it. Thanks. Thank you. Next slide. Uli is going to tell us about GDS, a new configuration and data definition language. So, hi, everybody. Do we cut the slide, Monica? No. Uh, I, just I had to do yeah. one click. Okay, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Bad start. Okay, so today I want to show you uh, some idea I had for a new data definition and configuration language. I named it GDS, which stands for General Data Structure. Um, it should be a universable and composable data structure uh, used to store any kind of data or any kind of information. Typical uses uh, should be the definition of configurations, specifications, and data sets. Um, the more specific um, concept of it is it uses um, hashes. Sorry, did I miss one? Oh. Okay, so more specific, it is um, it is uh, using hashes and arrays to construct these uh, data structures and basic values and also composition of nested hashes and arrays. Um, the keys of hashes are always symbols, so there is no other key possible. Just a basic example how it would look, look like in Ruby, you see a basic definition of a hash, of an array, or some composed structures, nested hashes with an array inside and array with a hash inside. So on top of this just basic uh, concept, I defined a language, a special DSL for general data structures. Um, it's using a succinct and indentation sensitive syntax. So it's using indentation um, to create the hierarchical structure, avoiding uh, curly braces and square brackets. Um, just a quick uh, definition of the syntax. Uh, you use a colon to define a hash. You use a comma to define an array. You can use vertical bar symbol to separate multiple values or multiple key value pairs on, on a single line. Um, for indentation, it's using always two space characters. Uh, it, you can use inline comments and block comments. So a simple example here, you see the top symbol is a comma, so an array is defined. Uh, within there is one element for this array, it's, it's defined with a colon, it's a hash, and uh, hash exists or it's using two, two key value pairs. The second one, the addresses, is again an array which containing again hashes. You see this vertical symbol defining all these key value pairs for these hashes. Um, uh, you, this is an example just of a nested hash. The default structure is a hash, so you, there is no need to define a colon on top level. You just can start typing keys and values, and you can define the substructure, just the nested hash. Um, for using it with Ruby, there is a gem available, GD struct. You have a um, class and a little method C for create. You g gave it the string of the definition, and it gives you back this Ruby hash array structure. Um, basic values are available as integers, floating points, um, Ruby symbols, string literals, single quoted and double quoted, keyword literals um, like true, false, and nil. This ones you have to prefix with an exclamation mark. And anything else which is not considered as the basic values before will be considered as a default string literal. Um, you can also use variables as placeholders for basic values. And you can use those variables later on in a location where you normally would use uh, um, a basic value, or you can use it inside double quoted or um, default strings. And string interpolation will just interpolate and substitute these variables for you. Um, then there are schema specifiers available uh, to facilitate the definition of um, data sets. 
with the schema specifier, you you define all the, um, the keys of the hash, and in the following lines, you only need to define the values, and everything is matched together for you. Uh, there are also references available. Um, you define a reference with an ampersand, you use it with an asterisk, and you can merge um, hashes into other hashes, uh, referencing them with, an f with a reference uh, definition, and you can insert arrays into other arrays, also using um, references in this insert directive. Um, references and schema specifiers are often used in combination um, to define um, um, relations between um, data sets, like associations like one-to-one, one, one to many many-to-one relationships, and you can define all of them in one block with all the relations, and it gives you back the result. Here is an example uh, for a simple data seed in Rails. You see you define all the relations in one block. There's, there's many, many relationships between authors and books, and then there is a simple block of code underneath, which is uh, creating the models for you and store the data in the <laughs> database files. Okay, this I skip, and there's just some references. If you are interested in, I'm, I would be glad to receive back any kind of feedback. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. For our next talk, Andre with Ruby without Rails. Good afternoon, Ruby on Ice. I'm Andre, I'm working for Bualtet Pro. We automate tax operations and accounting. And we probably cannot imagine Ruby ecosystem without Rails, which is pretty fine. But we have in other applications, like for example, the whole DevOps stack on Chef and Puppet. We have uh, the configuration framework for OpenSUSE, Yast, and we have a lot of emerging projects uh, outside from web development. Today I'm going to show you a couple of examples of machine learning applications and data science explorational tasks on the Ruby stack. What do I need to learn to become a data scientist? It depends. In 19... 92, you will probably want to learn SQL because we just got a new shiny language standard. In 2001, third generation of the R language appeared, so everybody learns R. In 2008, we have the prominent Pandas library for Python, so everybody is willing to become data scientists on the Python stack. and. Python outperforms today R and other technologies. And you probably want to learn Apache Spark, the new Julia language, not so new anymore, the tidyverse libraries, because data science is the sexiest job for the 21st century. In 2019, please try Ruby, but don't forget that we are staying on the shoulders of giants. All the bow applies uh, as before. So how do I start doing data science normally? Normally I open a Jupyter notebook or IPython notebook or Zebelin notebook if you want to work with it. But let's try to do it in Ruby. Uh, it's a screenshot. We have a Jupyter notebook with a loaded Ruby kernel, Ruby uh, 253. Occasionally I have it installed on my machine. We can install dependencies in the uh, OS specific way or uh, from the notebook uh, itself. And then we take a well known data set because we don't have time to prepare our data, the whole cleaning and uh, wrangling. The well known data set for time series is the data set on um, log strappings um, from the uh, R data set. So we load the library. Daru and Daru View for presenting um, stuff. It is something uh, which can be compared with Pandas. Uh, we load our data sets and present it in the tabular way. Then we want the graphical exploration phase 
and we can do it very nicely, for example, using Google Charts. Google Charts is taken here only for example's sake because we have a, a notebook and it is shiny, but think about integrating such charts in your Rails applications. Um, and in the next stage, we want to make predictions. We take another data set, like for example, the Iris data set, another very well-known data set among statisticians, and train a linear uh, support vector machine model on that using the SVM kit library, which is something comparable with the scikit learn in uh, Python. No more array, an array is uh, multi-dimensional and dimensional array like an array in Python. If you want more, and you do want more, <laughs> Please look at uh, these sources. Um, we have an um, extraordinary library called PyCal uh, for uh, calling Python transparently. You can look at works by the CyRuby community and Ruby data community. Look at the related libraries on the Ruby toolbox, which has been revived last year. Um, last but not least, you can look at the awesome lists for uh, machine learning in Ruby, natural language processing in Ruby, uh, and data science, and uh, for example, for the Ruby Kaigi presentations from the last years. Or just talk to us if you want more. Thank you. Thank you. That was interesting. Jakob, welcome on stage. Jakub is going to tell us about hardware and machine hacking with Ruby and Rails. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I'm really enjoying being here on Ruby on Ice conference. It's really nice. I'm Jakub, which is a Czech version of name in Jacob or Jim. And uh, you can also call me Kuba if you want with K. Um, <laughs> I'm here to present you uh, problem I was solving in the past with uh, machine uh, and by machine I mean uh, here I mean uh, food production line uh, which we are using in our company uh, uh, I work uh, for food company Mixit based in Prague in Czech Republic and this is our pa web pages uh, written in rails uh, and uh, our company produces misle, porridges, oh, sorry, <laughs> porridges um, and uh, fitness bars and so on. But um, the best customer feature of our company is uh, possibility you can mix your own uh, misle or porridge or something. Um, it looks like this. Uh <coughs> but uh, most of our apps are actually internal. We are using them for optimization the process of um, how to say um, uh, to putting uh, products together and s uh, sending them to the customer. And uh, here you can see uh, Peter, who's uh, <laughs> who is empl employee and he's uh, packing up order and he's beeping like uh, with barcodes. So, uh, and this is, uh, if you can see on the monitor, there are uh, rails up. So, um <coughs> here uh, you can see uh, what I meant by a machine. Uh, on the picture left, uh, there are owners, which, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> I don't have the time too much, uh, but there are two machines here. Uh, and uh, we are using them for production of the uh, individual uh, misle. Uh, in 2014, uh, we uh, we get uh, our first part of uh, machine. So we were starting starting thinking about optimization because the machine was uh, quite um, expensive and not really smart <laughs> because it has no memory and so on. So. Uh, I thought that the uh, only possible way is to go with native app, uh, like .NET or Java or Adobe Flex, if you know. Um, but I finally decided to go with Python and Qt, uh, which was um, at first a really good choice, because um, uh, Ruby is a um, little bit similar like Python. 
uh, but uh, after a month, I decided to <laughs> um, get rid of it and uh, rewrite the uh, whole project as a web app uh, with Ruby on Rails. Uh, so um, I was convinced, uh, convinced at, the, at the start that it's impossible to do it with a web app, uh, but I was wrong actually. Uh, uh, I said I thought in that time that uh, wait I, I know Ruby and I can do it as a web app. It will be quicker. It will be more re reliable because uh, uh, web app doesn't go down because your Windows computer decides it's right time to upgrade. Uh, <laughs> It can be controlled uh, remotely from anywhere, from my office, from my home, everywhere. Uh, it works on any kind of device and uh, operating system. It is easier to develop and maintain because uh, some problems I solved in a uh, Python and Qt took me like uh, a day and in a web app it was like 30 minutes. <coughs> okay, uh, this is our structure. Uh, we actually have uh, several web applications which is separate. Uh, we have also separate uh, web admins, and uh, all orders are actually uh, are grouped in MPT, which is a shortcut of a mixed production tool. And then, uh, because I needed actually single process um, application, um, because I had to solve problem with um, keeping uh, TCP IP connection alive. Um, this is a real application uh, we are using for controlling uh, the machine. Uh, it has some, some buttons there. Uh, this is the MPT, which, uh, which actually uh, are mainly uh, application for all production in our company. Um, I'm sorry, I do not have the time to share with you more code, but uh, here you can see that uh, it's actually written in pure Ruby, and it's awesome because it's uh, totally nice and clean code. Um, so, uh, good news is that it works in production for, mm, I don't know, three years. Um, <laughs> thank you, and uh, this is uh, one of our, our ingredients uh, called Ruby chocolate, made of uh, pink cocoa beans. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Do you ship to Germany? Last talk with a custom setup. Amr, come on stage. What's wrong with Ruby? What's wrong with Ruby? A lot of things. Okay. There. Ta da. Ta da. So <coughs> I will start with a shout out to Monica, actually. She's the first MC in the world that says my name without an I or an E between the M and the R. Don't clap, I don't have enough time, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, and I know you all are hungry and you want to go for lunch, but I just wanted to use this chance to kick, out, kick off my project that I, it's a research project that I'm trying to work on, which is called uh, What is Wrong with Ruby? And um, the motivation or the thing that caused me to think about this is that over the past few years, there is some sort of uh, Ruby bashing hype, uh, right? Like, so in many conferences, talks about Ruby is dead and bad-mouthing Ruby and all these kind of things. And in a sense, like, there is this question, is a hype necessarily means it's a fact or it necessarily means it's not a fact? And, you know, there is this statement, I, I think it's in many countries, this, like, there is no smoke without fire, but... I don't know. I mean, there is smoke without fire sometimes. <laughs> so I tried to dig deeper into the anatomy of the hype as a concept, right? And there is this blog post called Hype Dri Driven Development. This is the URL. We don't have time to like share everything, but this diagram focuses on, I want to focus on two things in it. First thing is that hypes usually start with a real problem and solutions. They don't just come out, out of nothing. The second thing is that there is always a moment of realization where the hype goes back down and we need to like start to, let's say, deconstruct this hype into something more solid, right? Something more logical. And I believe that seniors in our industry, the so-called seniors, right? People who get paid as seniors, like myself, uh, we owe it to people who are beginners or in their early career. Uh, we ought to actually explain why do we keep bashing Ruby and why do we keep uh, suggesting using new things. We have to be more solid into our claims, not just say, ah, oh, Elixir is much better, just use it. 
And the methodology of this is that I started some sort of a qualitative interviews round, right? So I will actually start to talk to people who maintain bigger projects, other implementations, and try to ask questions. So not to just impose my views as a, again, a so-called senior, no, but actually ask people from the community that are actually much more contributing to this. But so far, at least this is the part that comes with my opinion, I see more or less some around four points that are focal points uh, when, when, we, when I hear this bashing, right? The first one, which I like to refer to as the multiple CPU cores utilization. It's not just concurrency or parallelism, but there are like plenty of things around that, that sphere. Um, I think Benoit saved me a lot of time by just mentioning already the global interpreter lock and the C extension issues. But like also I think Ruby lacks a decent concurrency abstraction model, right? So it's not very intuitive. Concurrency and parallelism are not very intuitive and Ruby is, is good if you understand it enough, but for beginners it's not so easy to, to jump in. Also performance, Benoit saved me a lot of time, so I don't want to also dig into that, but I think that's a, a focal point that we sh I should focus on. The part that at least for me personally touches me a lot is the community contribution issues, because I mean, I don't think many people in this room decided to try to contribute to Ruby before, and it's not the mistake of the community, it's not the community mistaken, it's honestly the, the programming language is not so welcoming, the, the current implementation is not so welcoming for, for uh, contribution. And it's important to note that Ruby is a programming language, it's not just the MRI implementation, this is a language. And we have other implementations, we have Truffle, we have JRuby, we have MRuby, we have Rubinius, and I was surprised to hear that Benoit already works on something like Unified Specs because at the moment it's just the, the maintainers maintain a reference implementation but not really a programming language. And I don't know, some thim simple things like use Git for MRI, not SVN. I mean, it's not 1990s anymore. Um, one last thing that touches me a lot is coupling uh, to Rails in the Ruby community. So, I mean, we always say Ruby is a general purpose language, is it really? I'm not sure. And assume it is only for web, is Rails the only framework that we have? Is it the best framework that we have? I mean, for the, for the tool that you are building at the moment, so st stop to couple that much and maybe to point it out so clearly, there is this awesome quiz that was called Ruby on Rails, which I actually heard that Matt didn't score 10 out of 10 in it. So that's surprising, like no one knows that clear boundary between uh, Ruby and Rails actually. So lastly, uh, and I have 20, oh, it was perfect. Lastly, I have, this is my Twitter, this is my email, like please, if you want to contribute, if you have like some opinion, you want to take part of sharing into, like I don't know, sharing your opinion, want to wor work with me on the interviews. Yeah, I know my email is super long and it has so many weird names. Forget about that. <laughs> yeah, so just you please like guy, contact me. And, talk to him. and that's it, thank you. Go to have lunch. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. And we did it. Wow.